Last week, Eric Lander provided us with an exciting overview of the human genome, our DNA, and how this information is just now beginning to provide us with a fundamental understanding of our biology. Scientists at the Broad are using this information to understand the very essence of our genes and to understand the basics of how they work and how they shape human evolution. These same scientists are also applying this knowledge to understanding how differences within our genes contribute to devastating diseases such as cancer and diabetes. Tonight, you will hear from Diane Wirth, who co-directs the Broad's Infectious Disease Initiative. Diane will be describing how she uses genetic information to outsmart infectious disease. We hope that you enjoy tonight's lecture and we welcome your feedback. In response to last week's comments, we will be posting the public lectures on the Midsummer Nights website, and we've already posted a suggested reading list. For now, enjoy the lecture, Please feel free to ask questions, and we hope to see you again next week. Great. Okay. So is, is the microphone on? Excellent. Okay. Well, it is indeed um, a pleasure to be here. I'm Diane Wirth, and I'm actually on the faculty at the Harvard School of Public Health, and I'm an associate member here at the Broad. And I work on infectious diseases, um, uh, particularly my own area of focus is malaria. So you'll hear a little bit more about malaria tonight than you will about other infectious diseases, or at least the details. But I wanted to, before I started uh, talking about the specific kinds of things that we're doing here, I wanted to talk to you about infectious diseases and kind of where we stand today from a public health perspective and from a science perspective in understanding these important uh, diseases. Now, this is just a, um, uh, a pie diagram uh, taken from the World Health Report. This particular pie diagram, I think, is from the year 2003, but it would be very similar if it was from the year 2000, 2000 or the year 1950, in fact, or the year, probably the year 2006. And that is that, amazingly, today, um, a third of the deaths in the world third of the people who die, die from infectious diseases. This particular statistic has not changed um, in at least 100 years and probably longer. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about why that is, but this I always find it's a very surprising statistic, and I need to get the slide changer. So I'm going to see how much um, the audience knows about infectious diseases. So what do you think the big cause is of death due to infectious diseases are in our world today? Malaria is one, okay. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't be talking about this, right? Okay, what's another? Measles. Measles, uh, measles is uh, on the list, yep, but it's not as high as others, yes? A lack of clean water, but that's not really an infectious disease. That's sort of something which can lead to infectious diseases, mostly diarrheal diseases. Those are also very important. What else? Tuberculosis. tuberculosis. Actually, tuberculosis is the number one. Okay. Yep, HIV AIDS. So the big three are TB, malaria, and AIDS. And malaria and AIDS now are about the same, cause about the same number of deaths each year. So here is a sort of diagram, just to see the audience is pretty good. Um, this is actually an op-ed piece from um, the New York Times. This was written uh, in 2003. Uh, and the size of the banners actually indicates the importance of the disease in terms of global health. So you can see TB has the biggest banner, malaria next, HIV AIDS, the diarrheal diseases associated with clean water. Here's measles. Um, and, and there are a number of other uh, important diseases. This was written at the time of SARS, which is down here in the corner, just to show the relative importance of this in terms of global health. It's not to say that other diseases, other infectious diseases aren't important, but this is just to give you an idea of the burden of the disease. Now, how many people, you can probably read it on the slide, um, how many people do you think uh, have, for example, malaria each year? Those of you sitting close. Well, take a guess if you can't read it. 
a lot of people. It's about between the World Health Organization estimates between 300 and 500 million people. So that's about the population of the United States or about one and a half times the population of the United States. A child dies of malaria about uh, every 15 minutes. Um, so as we give this lecture, uh, the number of people who die of malaria, um, uh, the number of people who die of malaria each day um, equals um, sort of jumbo jets crashing one after another all day long. And so it's, it's very, this is a very important disease both in terms of the number of people that have it and the burden it creates on society. And that's similarly true for tuberculosis and for HIV AIDS. Okay. So, but another disease, what's another disease that's becoming uh, in our, has reached our radar screen as infectious diseases? Yeah, avian flu, and I'm going to talk about that at the end, not particularly because we're doing anything at the moment at the Broad, but because I think this is another place where, in fact, genomic analysis has really helped us begin to understand the spread of the organism and I think is going to lead us in the future to ways to control the disease. Okay, so um, now we've been successful, okay, in controlling infectious diseases and in many ways. Uh, the era of antibiotics has really controlled most of the major infectious diseases. In addition, vaccines. I mean, for those of you who are um, my age or older, uh, you in fact have been vaccinated um, for the polio virus. Uh, polio has been eliminated by vaccination in the Western Hemisphere, and we're on the route to eliminating um, infectious uh, polio uh, throughout the world. There are only a few places in the world now where polio transmission still occurs. So this was a disease, a crippling disease, a disease of enormous burden, which has been controlled by intervention. So why is it that, you know, so we're making this progress. We have drugs, antibiotics, or anti-infectives, uh, not just biotics, not just antibacterials, and vaccines. But why is it that we're not making progress? Why do, why do still a third of the people in the world um, uh, have infectious diseases? Well, there are many reasons. Um, I've listed a few on this slide. Uh, one thing that's happened is, of course, uh, the globalization of risk, and we'll come back to talk about that when we talk about avian influenza. The important thing for diseases like malaria and tuberculosis is the fact that although drugs were developed and were effective, in fact, um, these organisms have become resistant. And that's true of, of many bacteria, many infectious agents are resistant. And of course, in HIV AIDS, where drug treatment is relatively recent, there's also resistance to single therapies, to single drug treatment, and that's why one, in the case of HIV AIDS, in the case of tuberculosis, has gone to this multiple drug treatment to try to slow the emergence of resistance. But it's a constant battle between the organism trying to survive and the drug or the vaccine trying to control it, or the human immune system. And finally, I think, um, well, we also have relatively few new drugs for the diseases I'm particularly interested in and we'll be talking about today, tuberculosis and malaria. And finally, new diseases like HIV AIDS, like SARS, and in some ways like avian influenza, all that, that's kind of a repeat um, of old diseases. So in fact, these factors really contribute to the uh, increased, uh, the, the constant risk of death uh, due to infectious diseases. So the disease patterns change a little bit, but in fact, um, uh, we are still, if, if one had to keep score between the human population and infectious diseases, the microbes, that is the infectious diseases, are winning. Um, despite all of our technological development, uh, they continue to uh, cause enormous global burden of disease. So obviously, one of our motivations for undertaking the study of these organisms is to develop new solutions. We need um, both effective vaccines and new drugs. And I think an important thing, which I won't be talking about today, but something that of course is very important, is many of these diseases occur in resource-poor regions of the world. 
where in fact the health, there are very few health care dollars per person. And so one of the problems, even when there are effective treatments, is getting sustainable delivery to the sites. And that's not something I'm going to spend much time on today, but I think it's something those of in the, us in the field need to think about. And, and those of us in the population at large need to realize that in order to control these diseases, we will need a way to get the interventions to the populations most effective. Okay. So we're just going to go through sort of some of the risks, globalization of risk. As you know, uh, air travel is increasing. It increases about 7% a year. And of course, most prominently in the SARS epidemic, we saw that the emergence of a, probably a single or a small number of cases somewhere in South Asia led to the spread of that disease um, throughout uh, almost all of the continents of the world. And so and that happened in a relatively short period. Now, you might think this is an isolated example, but in fact, when I come back and talk to you about the spread of drug resistance in malaria, you're actually going to see that it's a very similar phenomenon. The drug resistance actually started in a single place um, or in a couple of places around the world and spread rather than it independently emerging in different places. And we now have uh, very strong genetic evidence for that. I'll talk about that a little bit. But I, because this is a very general talk, I won't go into the details. But any of you who are interested in some of the details of the science of, of this aspect, I'll be happy to spend time afterwards. Or you can, you're welcome to email me about it. OK, so the spread of infectious agents is extremely important and probably something that we've underestimated. Now, this is drug resistance for Plasmodium falciparum. This is uh, just a pictorial description uh, for chloroquine resistance. This is, in fact, uh, one of the best antimalarial drugs ever developed. And it took about 20 years for resistance to appear. It appeared twice independently, once in South America and once in Southeast Asia. But uh, it rapidly spread, such that there is now chloroquine resistance, and I'll come back to malaria in a, in a little bit more detail in a minute, but this has spread uh, throughout all the places where the disease exists. So that, in fact, there is almost nowhere in the world where you can use chloroquine to, to effectively treat Plasmodium falciparum malaria as we speak today. Now, this is not limited to malaria. This is just a, an example um, that I, wanted, I want to show you to sort of demonstrate how important this particular factor is in our understanding of infectious diseases. Now, um, in fact, chloroquine turns out to be the best antimalarial drug. Here's just a timeline kind of drawn to show you the emergence of resistance. So it took resistance about 16 years from the introduction of chloroquine until there was full uh, clinical resistance at the first site. Uh, other drugs were developed. Uh, Fancidar, which is a combination drug, has its two drugs. The thought was this will, of course, act for much longer. But in fact, you can see resistance appeared very rapidly. Here's another drug, mefloquine. This drug is related to quinine. And we'll come back to the fact that there are very few new ideas, new chemistries being applied to these organisms. And that's, of course, one of the things we're trying to do here with our work at the Broad in collaboration with the chemical biology group. Um, but here's the winner. This is the latest, the last antimalarial drug to be developed and registered. It's a tovaquone. It actually failed when the drug was being tested in patients, so in the first six months. And this tells us that the selection pressure, the ability of the drug to kill the organism obviously is very strong, but the organism, you know, in its, in its desire, if you, one can sort of think of an organism as having desire, in its, in its desire to survive actually is able to mutate. Uh, mutations are able to be selected in a very short period of time. And in fact, this particular drug was never released as a single drug. It is the basis of the antimalarial drug that many of you have probably taken if you've traveled abroad called malarone. Um, it's a drug now in combination with two other drugs or with one drug which becomes converted to a second drug. Um, 
so that, in fact, um, a single point mutation, a single change in the genome of the plasmodium parasite converts the parasite from sensitive to this drug to resistant, and that can be isolated in a single step in a human patient. And so you can see what a challenge this is uh, for those of us in the field of biology to actually find a way to kill the organism uh, effectively and over the long term. Okay. Now, of course, one of the other problems, and I've just mentioned this, and this is true not just for malaria, it's true for TB, it's less true for HIV AIDS, but it's, for example, true for influenza, that in fact, of all of the uh, 1,400 or so chemical entities developed in the last 25 years, less than 1% of these is actually for the infectious agents we've been talking about. And I think that's also a very important concept. Part of that is driven by the fact that in many cases these diseases occur in resource-poor environments, so there's not a market. But some of it is the, there's not been the sort of full force attention to these organisms um, applied using modern technologies. And I think that's one of the things we're trying to do here at the Broad is to kind of change that paradigm to begin to bring to bear a sort of modern knowledge um, on, the, uh, on, on these important infectious agents. Okay. Um, so, and finally, there are new diseases. This is, we've already talked about this. This is avian influenza. And this, of course, is the current fear uh, of the world. And I think realistic fear that this disease could, in fact, emerge and spread. And we'll come back to talking about that toward the end of my talk um, to sort of give you a sense of the kinds of things that people are thinking about, the kinds of questions that people are asking to make important discoveries um, in this organism. OK, so um, here's, a, here's a group of people, some you'll recognize. Um, and here's another one some of you will recognize. What do you think they have in common? They all have something in common. Polio, OK. Uh, polio was one guess. Died of an infectious disease. No, this is actually, oops. I think this guy is on the Seattle Mariners, right? Is that right? I think he's still with us. What? Right, they had tuberculosis, right? So in fact, this slide was meant to phase in, say, tuberculosis. OK, so all of these people sort of, tuberculosis has been with us uh, throughout history. There are famous people who've had tuberculosis, including, uh, in this case, the namesake or the founder of Harvard University is, uh, and in fact, if you look at the statue, I'm told he has that caved in chest, that sort of gaunt look common in sufferers of tuberculosis before there were drugs to treat tuberculosis. And of course, um, many of the people on the previous picture were, had tuberculosis at a time when there was no treatment. Fortunately, today, there are drugs which can treat TB, but of course, resistance is there is also a problem. And so, um, you know, TB, as, as we've looked at the beginning, TB rates are rising. Um, it's probably the most common cause of death um, in HIV patients throughout the world. About a third of the world's population is infected. There are 8 million new cases each year and 2 million deaths. It's a long-term disease and one um, which uh, the group here at the Broad now is beginning to look at in a very uh, specific way. That is beginning to try to understand the organism at the genome level. So uh, trying to understand what genes are important in the bacteria, what genes lead to virulence, what genes lead to persistence. This work is in its relatively formative stages. Did you have a question? Yeah, I, I did actually. How, how do the numbers add up with 8 million cases each year? That's right. How it's do a, you get to a third of the world's population? Well, it's, it's a third of the world's population. That's right. How do you get to a third of the world's population? Because it's a chronic disease, so people in tend to be infected. In years, that would be 400 million people, which is less than 10%. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Give you the reason, so yeah. Let's go back to the first slide and see. It's a good question, actually. I, I like to see. We're expecting 
Let's just go back and see. It's a good question. I'm not sure I know the answer. Let's go back to the TB numbers. Two million deaths. So each year, 1% of the world's population becomes infected with the TB germ. Um, hmm. Don't know. It's a good question. I'll find out. Um, I guess a third of the popula world's population is at risk, probably. That's probably the, the right way to think about it. Because, in fact, you're absolutely right, and I, uh, I uh, stand corrected. Yes? The 8 million cases that are active, is that possible? And of those possible. 8 million cases, 2 of them actually are terminal, or 2 million of them are actually terminal. Yeah, you know, I would say this is a very good group, and I don't absolutely know the answer to this, but I will figure it out and we'll get back to you. Um, because it is. You know, it, it is interesting. Well, I don't know the answer, so I won't speculate. Is, uh, we have, it, it's possible that that's right, that there's latent infection, although I think um, certainly the, the number, the, I think a third of the world's population is definitely at risk. It, it is tr probably, this, is, this slide is probably incorrect in the sense that, it, that this uh, has the potential to be infected. So I, uh, I will stand corrected and find out. Okay, so the, let's go back to the, so we'll continue on what the Broad is doing. So this, this work is in the relatively early stages at the Broad, but the idea is to really understand how parasites that lead to death, okay, or how uh, bacteria that lead to death are different than those cases which are latent or just infected but not leading to death. So the idea is, is there something about the organism that's specifically different that leads to a different clinical outcome? And similarly, in those organisms or those people who are infected that carry um, resistance, or in the case of TB, multi-drug resistance, what are the targets? How does the organism become resistant? And can we use that information to develop new drugs? And so. Um, uh, there are a couple of faculty members uh, who are associate members and a recent new member of um, the, uh, the Broad faculty, Deb Hung, who are going to work on tuberculosis to begin to understand these very underlying principles using a combination of genomics and uh, chemical biology to understand the organism. Okay, so now we're going to move on to malaria. Um, Malaria is carried by the Anopheles mosquito, uh, and it, for the clinical part of the disease, it infects human red cells. Now, in fact, the parasite, all of the clinical symptoms, are associated with the parasite invading human red cells, and then these red cells uh, adhering, in the case of the severe form of the disease, uh, to the capillaries in the brain leading to coma um, and, uh, and uh, symptoms of anemia. The parasite grows inside the red cell, uses the hemoglobin of the red cell as its source of amino acids or building blocks to make new parasites, and then the parasite reinvades new red cells, continuing the cycle. And so it is this phase of the parasite life cycle that most of our work is focused upon. Now, the, um, the parasite has had an enormous effect in history. And in fact, this is the most obvious of the traits. Uh, the sickle uh, hemoglobin uh, trait, this is a mutation. And Eric talked to you last week about sort of naturally occurring mutations or polymorphisms in the human genome that give advantage to um, the, uh, uh, to the in this case, that give advantage to the parasite, uh, advantage to the host, 
to kill the parasite or to prevent the parasite from growing. And so you have this very interesting distribution of sickle cell anemia uh, following, uh, in fact, the distribution of falciparum malaria in the world. And it is because in a person who carries a gene uh, for the sickle hemoglobin or this polymorphism mutation in the hemoglobin gene, that person is protected from having severe malaria. Yet if, if two copies of that gene are carried by the person, that's generally fatal, particularly fatal uh, before uh, advanced medical intervention. And so in fact, um, here is um, a, um, uh, here is a, uh, an example of a parasite actually providing a selection in the human population. And there are several other examples of this, but it tells you, I think, how important this infection is uh, in, in selecting human mutations. The survival of the human, the, 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 the death caused by infection with malaria is as important as death caused by uh, homozygous sickle trait, because the trait gets to about 25% in the um, affected populations. And so, in fact, uh, it tells you that this disease is very important, not only now, but it has been throughout history. Now, uh, this also has an important historical component. Um, here is uh, a picture of Oliver Cromwell, who died of malaria because he was unwilling to take quinine, which was the original anti-malarial. This is the actual source of the chemical, the synthetic versions, chloroquine. This was the original natural product or ethno-pharmaceutical uh, because it was known as Jesuit bark. And obviously, for religious reasons, he couldn't have something discovered by the Jesuits. Uh, it is, um, here is chloroquine. And so another important sort of historical moment, and there are many people in history who have died of malaria, um, uh, often uh, uh, often explorers and travelers. So this, this disease not only affects people living in endemic countries, but it, it affects people worldwide and populations worldwide. Might he have escaped death or malaria has, had his physicians dared to use Jesuit bark? Okay, we've also had malaria um, in the United States. Um, uh, and perhaps the 1970s is a, is a little bit of a stretch, but certainly through the 1950s, there was transmission of malaria throughout the entire Tennessee Valley in the United States. We today have transmission almost every year of malaria, um, but of course it's detected and controlled. Now how many people um, know how the United States controlled malaria? We, we no longer have endemic malaria or even epidemic malaria. What? See, what did you say? DDT, right, so we used insecticides. What else? Uh, so insecticide, residual spraying. What else? Draining swamps, so we did some environmental uh, things. What else? Taking the drugs when you travel to where it's popular. Excuse me, what? Taking the drugs of prevention when you go into an area. Okay, right, so we, we treated, we identified cases and treated, or in some cases prophylaxis was used. Yes, back there. Quarantine. What? Quarantine. Um, well, it's, it's pretty effectively treated. Identifying cases, I think, so case identification. Okay, what are all those measures? They're all public health. Now, how many people know the origins of the Centers for Disease Control in the United States? What? No, it's, oh, the Center of Disease Control has its origins in the Malaria Control Program. It actually was the Malaria Control Program, which then migrated or grew to become the Centers for Disease Control. So in fact, the United States controlled malaria through a combination of strategies, attacking the insect vector, the parasite identifying breeding sites for mosquitoes. So an integrated approach to controlling disease. So it can be controlled, and we'll come back to that a little bit later when I talk about uh, the new approaches. Okay. So transportation, sanitation, nutrition. 
Okay, so now um, I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about um, the parasite and parasite, the parasite genome and the kinds of things that we're trying to do to understand how the parasite genome will tell us about what we can do to control this disease, to tell us about the biology of the organism. And so um, the Plasmodium falciparum uh, genome has been sequenced and in fact now the other major human malaria genome, Plasmodium vivax, has also been sequenced by, by Tiger in Washington, uh, another group. Uh, and we here at the Broad have really concentrated on using this genomic information and in fact expanding it to begin to understand the parasite. In addition, uh, the genomes in this case of the vector mosquito have been sequenced. So in fact, we have essentially all of the information we need to begin to understand this parasite at a very fundamental level uh, available uh, sort of in online databases. And this has really transformed our thinking about the field. Now, we here at the Broad have really been concentrating on understanding the genetic diversity of the parasite throughout the world to begin to understand how the parasite differs. The, both the clinical features, the, the drug resistance patterns, many of the properties that we think are conferred by the parasite onto the patient and disease are in fact distributed geographically in the world. And so we are looking uh, by using methodologies developed here at the Broad primarily to look at the human genome for the parasite genome. And we have really uh, now just completed the first analysis of this looking at a worldwide set of samples and are beginning to understand both how the parasite becomes resistant to drug and in fact making new discoveries about molecules which show a great deal of polymorphism or variation which we think are indicators of those molecules interacting with the host immune system. And so looking at the host parasite interface through looking at the footprint of the selection of the host, either the immune system or the drugs that have been given to people to begin to understand that biology. Um, so as we uh, look at this, and now I'm coming back to this question of the spreading um, of drug resistance. Remember I talked about the importance of, in the case of SARS, we had a very clear example of the spreading of drug resistance. Well, in fact, when we began this work, we really thought that, um, that drug resistance in plasmodium, particularly drug resistance where a single or a small number of point mutations could lead to resistance, was in fact uh, carried, uh, was in fact independently arising in different sites through overuse of drugs. You know, for example, uh, in many parts of the world you can get anti-malarial drugs without a prescription. Every time someone has a fever, they take anti-malarial drugs. Often people given drugs at clinics don't complete their treatment, and all of these things are known to contribute to the emergence and spread of resistance. And so we just assumed that was going to be the case. However, as we began to look at the genomes of these parasites, we realized that, in fact, probably there was a single event, and it probably actually didn't occur in Africa, it probably occurred in Southeast Asia, um, and that single event has spread throughout, in this case, Africa for resistance to Fancidar. And so it is, in fact, now through this genetic information that we've generated here at the Broad, we now are beginning to understand not only the mechanism of resistance, but how it spreads. Yeah, it's a very interesting question. So in some cases, um, it appears that there's no growth disadvantage to the resistant parasite, and so um, the, they compete, and wherever drug is used, you see an increasing prevalence of the resistant parasite. In, in some cases, such as chloroquine resistance, um, in fact, there's now very relatively recent data 
that in fact, if chloroquine pressure is withdrawn in a population, this was done in Malawi, not as an experiment, but as a public health measure. If chloroquine was removed from the market and people were made to purchase or receive second and third line drugs because of extensive resistance, the sensitive, the sensitive parasites began to reappear in that population. So that probably argues that there's some growth disadvantage in the absence of drug of a resistant parasite. And so it depends, I think, a little bit on the mutations. And, and we now know from looking at, in, in detail at the, at the genetics of this drug resistance that, in fact, there may be a single primary mutation that leads to resistance. But then there are multiple other changes in the genome which we suspect help the resistant parasite in its survival in the population. And so, in fact, this is really a population biology question, but surprising to us. So that also tells us something. This can be immediately used uh, to begin to, to develop surveillance systems. And so we now are in the process of developing what we're, what we're sort of calling, using the, the ex example of the human haplotype map, a plasmodium falciparum, a malaria haplotype map. It actually will probably be more like identification of the resistant mutations. But the idea is to be able to develop a technology which will allow us to detect resistance um, and then do surveillance so that, in fact, we can inform drug treatment policies throughout Africa. So our plan is to go from this very basic science of understanding the genomes of these organisms and how the genomes differ worldwide to actually having a tool that we can help uh, the world understand uh, spread of resistance and stay ahead of the curve so that, in fact, there's always um, effective drug available. And in fact, in cases where spread of resistant organisms is the most important means of introducing resistance, it may in fact be that public health measures, similar to those that, I to that we talked about just a moment ago, used in the United States, sort of a very concentrated effort around a focus of resistant parasites, may actually prevent sort of in, from a public health sense, the spread of that resistance into a broader population. And so this idea of taking sort of knowledge that we've generated from understanding the genome all the way to the field, I think, is very exciting and something that we're really in the process of doing. OK, so <clears throat> now we go back to the timeline. Eric may have shown you this timeline of discovery. This is the discovery of um, DNA, uh, the timeline. And here we go. This is DNA structure and genetic code and all of these things. When do you think the last time a new antimalarial drug was discovered along this timeline? Anyone have a guess? Before the timeline. No, no, it's on the timeline. <laughs> what? OK, we have one guess in the 90s. Any other? Any other takers? 2000, OK. No, that was resistance, right? That was spread of resistance. OK, it's right here. Around the same time the structure of DNA was determined, that was when Atovaquil, and that was that drug that failed <coughs> in, um, in six months. That drug, the original precursor, the kind of concept, the molecule that led to that eventual drug, was discovered in the mid-1950s. So in fact, my message here is that, in fact, there's a lot of information. Just the genome sequences alone are giving us enormous uh, kind of knowledge base that hasn't yet been applied uh, to this organism. Now, as we look, um, and so here at the Broad, we're also attacking, you know, sort of we have the genomics approach to understand the organism and have that teach us things about its biology, and I've given you drug resistance as an example, but sort of in parallel, we're actually taking sort of the, the vast knowledge of chemistry and the chemical approaches and applying that to the organism. And we're doing that sort of in two general ways. One way is we're taking a whole set of, of conceptually new and exciting compounds that have never been tested before. And uh, we've developed an assay where you can actually test the parasites directly and measure growth of the parasites. And I'm sure this isn't showing up because of the light in the room. But you can actually measure uh, either parasites alive or dead 
in these compounds. And, and these markers are to indicate hits or compounds which actually kill the parasite. So here we're taking a very general approach. We're saying we have a lot of new chemistry. Let's see what works to kill the parasite. And we have now a, a number of molecules that are interesting. We're also taking a much more high-tech approach. We have, uh, and this is work from John Clardy's group, also the, uh, the co-director of the Infectious Disease Initiative, in this case uh, showing an enzyme which we know is critical in the parasite uh, uh, nucleic acid synthetic pathway. Uh, it's an enzyme that also is a target uh, for cancer chemotherapy, but this is the parasite enzyme. And we're now able to use, again, the innovative chemistry of the Broad Chemical Biology Group to begin to identify molecules which bind and inhibit this enzyme and then eventually inhibit the parasite. So we're taking this sort of two-pronged approach, uh, general kind of unbiased question, what kills the parasite? In a second, very targeted. These are target enzymes that we know are important. How can we use chemistry um, to, to treat, um, uh, to develop treatments for the parasite? And you know, really surprisingly, I think, in, in the year or so that this project has been going on, we're really down to a very focused number of molecules that we're concentrating on where, in fact, we have new leads for anti-malarial drug development, and we're hoping that this is something we'll be able to push forward. OK, now this, I come back to sort of confidence and, and everything. These are actually the postage stamps which commemorate the, Amer uh, the malaria eradication campaign. I have the originals of these in my office. I keep them there to have humility. This was a program by the World Health Organization um, developed for the eradication of malaria. It was conceived in 1950. We had uh, insecticide, DDT, and we had chloroquine. Of course, and, and the vision was that we could eliminate malaria from the world with these two uh, tools. We did it in the United States. In fact, that's when it was done in the United States. But there is a stamp for, um, there are a 100 of these stamps for all the countries where malaria was endemic at the time. Uh, there are very few countries where, in fact, transmission of the disease has been interrupted. And of course, we know it's possible. We were very close. In Sri Lanka, we were down to less than 100 cases. The world was less to less than 100 cases a year. Last year, again, Sri Lanka was up over 100,000. Uh, and in the past two decades, it's been close to a million cases a year. The parasite became resistant to drug. The, the mosquitoes became resistant to insecticide. So that this process, we understand, is going to require a multifaceted approach. It's going to involve development of new drugs, new insecticides, and new immunological interventions, including vaccines. But it's, it's going to be doable. Um, so I, I keep this just to remind myself that other very smart people have tried. And uh, it's possible, but it's going to be a lot of work. And it's going to take more than one approach. OK, I'm just going to spend the last couple of minutes, and then I'm happy to take more questions, um, talking about the sort of threat of, of avian flu. So we, I think the, the major concept here, again, is a genetic concept. And here, I just want to show you examples of what, what's happened with uh, different flus. They're not all uh, avian flus. They're different. Uh, they're flus of different sources, but these are flus which have led to influenza pandemics in the 20th century. The most important one you will all know about is the 1918-1919 Spanish flu, and this led to about 100 million deaths. It's one of the only events in history to actually change sort of the population growth of the world. You see a dip around 1918-1919. Uh, there is a prediction that a similar kind of dip may occur with HIV AIDS, but I think with the advent of drugs, in fact, that may not be the case. Um, there was the Asian flu. Probably many of you lived through that. There were a smaller number of deaths, but still a, a, a genetic shift, a shift, an antigenic shift in this, leading to a large number of, of a serious uh, burden of disease. And in 1968, a Hong Kong flu. Again, uh, similar to the Asian flu in terms of worldwide population global burden of disease. So I think that the real question now um, is it, it is possible this, uh, it's not clear in the historical cases exactly what the history 
of the um, organism that led to these pandemics was. However, <clears throat> there is clearly this question of how a genome, in this case it's an RNA genome, so it's, it's, it's a genome more susceptible to, uh, or there's a higher frequency of mutation. Um, and so you can imagine, and there's a very high number of viral genomes, it's a very small genome, um, that it, it can clearly be transferred to people, and we've seen several examples. The real question is, the important thing from a public health and from a burden of disease point of view is, can you get efficient human-to-human -human transmission, because that is what's going to lead to the spread and the pandemic. And it is understanding these kinds of genetic shifts. So in some ways, this is just like drug resistance. That is, you know, it's going from being uh, one type of uh, organism to another, and then finally to one that can spread broadly. So this, again, we know is mediated by changes in the genome of the organism, which leads to changes in the proteins and, the vir and, and hence the virulence of the organism. And of course, now the worldwide sort of strategy is to look at the genomes of avian influenza or other influenzas, those that get into people, and those that are transmitted to understand the underlying basis for this shift. This can be used both to develop interventions, but it can also be used to develop a surveillance system, similar to what I was talking about for malaria drug resistance. So you can take this very fundamental knowledge and apply it almost immediately to these um, organisms. And so I think with that, I will end. Um, also, well, I guess one final thing. We also think that probably knowing about uh, genomics and genetics and understanding the organism will help uh, develop control measures that are uh, sort of more sophisticated than the current way of controlling influenza, which is to burn uh, the infected bird populations. And so um, we think that applications of this kind of knowledge will help us actually move forward uh, in this field. But our goal is obviously to, to have healthy, uh, in this case, children. In many cases, these diseases have their greatest impact on children. It's particularly true in, in malaria, where in fact, uh, almost all of the mortality due to malaria uh, is in children. And so we obviously want healthy, happy um, children that are, that are free of disease. And I think it's important um, that to realize that the Broad is making a very important contribution to this, but doing it sort of uh, in, an, in an environment where it has interaction with many other institutions worldwide, both in the areas of basic science, but also in the areas of public health. And I think the real strength of, of taking very basic knowledge and applying it to these very important problems of global health is that you can see sort of immediate applications, and in the long term, I think understanding the biology, the transmission, the interactions of these diseases is going to lead us to make fundamental changes in how we approach uh, control of these organisms. There may be strategies we haven't thought of yet. Uh, we know that vaccines are important, but our work in malaria, for example, tells us that the antigens, for the most part, that are being targeted as vaccines, the proteins that are the kind of the top vaccine candidates, actually, if we look at them on a worldwide basis, we already know there are variants out there that will escape a vaccine. That may be one of the reasons it's such a challenge to make a vaccine to these more complex organisms like uh, malaria, like tuberculosis, and like HIV. It may be that genetic variation actually undermines uh, our ability to use standard immunological processes. After all, the human immune system essentially evolved as a mechanism to control outside invasion by microorganisms, and the microorganisms have been in the process of evolving to evade the human immune system for the same amount of time. And so, in fact, uh, it's kind of this battle, and um, as I said earlier, the microorganisms are still, still have us on the run. So with that, I think I'll stop and take any questions. Thank you. Other drugs that have complex organic compounds uh, for what they're something like a little silver comes to mind, not necessarily that, but 
Well, you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, my feeling is, you know, if, if you look at the number of chemical entities that are used as anti-infectives, it's a tiny number of, you know, sort of the whole uh, breadth of chemistry out there. So I think there's a lot of opportunity in, in chemistry. But I think the concept of using completely different strategies, certainly using biologicals, is something that many people are, are thinking about. But for the, so for certain infections, that might be very important. For these infections that occur in resource-poor environments, one has to think about this sustainable, you know, sort of in, interventions. But, uh, you know, I, I would say it's worth thinking about. I think it's worth thinking outside the box, and, and we now have the information to do that. Questions? Yes. Okay. Well, I think, yeah, for each, so for each drug, there seems to be a spectrum of mutations. So there's, generally speaking, a primary mutation that all resistant organisms carry. And then there appear to be other sort of compensatory or additional mutations, which, which are, get, we don't know, but our guess is those contribute to the viability of the organism, either in the presence or the absence of drug. Right. I mean, that's, of course, the perfect drug. If we could find a drug where if there's a mutation, the, once it mutates, it can't survive in the absence of drug, that would be fabulous. And, and certainly people are thinking about that, but that's not been too successful in other systems where it's been tried. But, but I mean, one of the interesting things is as we're screening through the, the libraries here, we are finding drugs that differentially affect sensitive and resistant parasites. So one strategy might be to put two drugs together, one that kills resistant parasites, one that kills sensitive, a new idea of combination therapy rather than the, the sort of concept that's been used so far, which is to try to use drugs in a similar pathway. Yes? Um, assuming that your slide, very interesting slide, that you have a shorter and shorter time for emergence of resistance over time, represents true biology and not something else going on. Right. Uh, has your look now with your genetic data provided any explanation for that phenomenon? Well, I think part of the explanation for that is that the drugs are all related to one another, right? So that, in fact, what you have is sort of newer versions of, you know, so that's true definitely with methylquine and chloroquine. In the case, I think what that data tells us, if, if a single point mutation can lead to clinical resistance, then you're going to see it very rapidly, and that's what atovacone is. So as you go to more and more targeted drugs, remember sort of the old-fashioned drugs, chloroquine, quinine, you know, uh, even the artemisinin compounds, the newest of the antimalarial drugs, but from the herbal um, uh, tradition, we don't, they probably have multiple mechanisms of action. But as we go to this targeted single enzyme, which is kind of the, you know, sort of modern approach to drug development, what happen, what apparently can happen, if a single point mutation can overcome that, as, as we saw with the tovaquin, you can get clinical resistance immediately. Whereas with drugs like chloroquine and Fancidar, you, our, our data shows that you need multiple mutations in single genes or multiple mutations in, in multiple, different mutations in multiple genes to get clinical resistance. So in fact, it may be that, you know, in some ways we're too smart by targeting a, a single protein. But I think that's really the only way we can go. And, and one of the reasons we went to the whole organism screen was to sort of go back and say, well, maybe there are some things that we could use that, that have multiple targets. Okay. Yes. Um, well, there, yeah, there's been, um, you mean, in, like in the mosquito, not specifically compete, but there is some work to try to get uh, path bacteria that are pathogenic to the organism that can also infect mosquitoes, so that a sort of natural control of the population within the mosquito. Um, it's interesting, you know, there's a lot of work in mosquitoes that I didn't have time to talk about, partly because we're not concentrating on here to indicate that, in fact, there's a lot of naturally occurring mosquito strains that are resistant to the transmission of the disease. And so, in fact, we're, a lot of groups are trying to understand and maybe try to use that 
um, in some way to engineer mosquitoes that are completely resistant to transmission. Okay, back here, and then there was one. Yeah. Right, there is resistance in mosquitoes to D in in yes, there are many insects that are resistant to DDT in the United States. Right. The parasite. Well, no, the parasite. Um, I think in part because the disease was never wholly endemic here. I don't think there was ever enough you know, sort of widespread drug pressure. So we, we never used widespread prophylaxis. So for example, in South America, they used chloroquine and table salt because it was such a good drug, cheap. They figured they could just cover the population with table salt. Well, those of you who are geneticists know that's the perfect way to isolate a mutation. We never had that level of drug use. And in fact, the chloroquine resistance gene is fascinating. It has at least six mutations in it um, which are required to get resistance. So you have to think about that. You know, that the, the chances of that happening are, you would think, so, so small that it could never happen. But remember, one of the interesting sort of statistics, which I always make the medical students calculate, because I figure they should know hematocrit, but I won't make this group do it. There are 10 to the 19th parasites in the world as we speak today. So that that's an enormous number of genomes onto which selection, you know, so just if there's just variation just by the standard mechanisms of, mis, you know, mistakes in DNA synthesis, you can get every viable mutation every year. And so um, it's not hard to, I think it, it, it is, it's hard to imagine how you can get six mutations. There must have been some intermediate steps which we don't see a history for. But now that we have um, sort of this this ability to look at a lot of genomes, we're going to look historically at genomes and see whether we can begin to see how this happened. There was a question down here, yes. Yeah, uh, what I said is genomic research is employed in finding a uh, viable vaccine for Right, there's a lot of that being done, right? So, so in fact, uh, as, as you probably know, the flu vaccine every year makes use of genomics. Essentially, uh, the normal, you know, kind of flu vaccine, uh, par uh, viruses are isolated primarily in Asia, sequenced, and then a decision is made about which virus is likely to be the most prevalent, and that's the vaccine that's made. So it's actually entirely based on, on now on genome sequencing analysis. So for avian flu, that's exactly what's happening. Um, you know, the one that's expected to, uh, to come through um, is in fact the one that people are trying to make vaccines to. But of course, it's a guess. We, you know, it's a guess that that will be the antigen that's the predominant antigen in the parasite. And that's why I think this concept of surveillance, of actually watching what's going on in the world, because remember, in the world, the natural experiment is occurring every single day. You know, the, the virus is entering people, um, it's growing in chickens, um, and some are successful and most are not. In fact, in, in malaria, our guess is um, that the parasite actually probably entered humans many times before it successfully was able to shift to being transmitted from, well, not, not from human to human in this case, but from mosquito to human and then uh, back to mosquito and to human again. Remember, that, that sort of biological selection and evolution had a lot of tries, a lot of shots on goal before it actually made it through to an epidemic organism. And that's what's happening with the viruses. And that's probably also what happened with HIV and its original, it, it, it now is clear that it came from a primate virus that probably entered humans many times, but was only once or maybe twice successful. There's both HIV-1 and HIV-2, which both are successful, one more than the other. Okay, back there. Yeah. To what extent do you think the pharmaceutical arena has contributed to this problem, either in terms of basic science or even contributing their very large numbers of libraries to screen? It, it's a good question. I mean, the pharma industry in general has not been interested particularly in diseases like malaria and TB, because there's not much of a market, right? Although there are a lot of people with these diseases, they're generally people in resource-poor environments. I think you're seeing a shift now. There certainly is involvement. There are public-private partnerships funded by the Gates Foundation. I think the Gates Foundation entering into 
uh, this arena has caused a renaissance and a, a renewed interest. But I, I think it's also safe to say I'm just back from a, a conference of uh, sort of high-powered biotechnology types and venture capitalists where I, you know, there were several of us there, the TB Alliance and, and Drugs for Neglected Diseases and the malaria groups, um, trying to convince them that biotechnology should get involved. Um, and again, um, you know, without a, without a clear market, because that industry is driven by market, um, there are a few pioneers that are, that are involved, uh, but Genzyme, for example, is collaborating here at the Broad. GlaxoSmithKline is co collaborating with MMV and with various academic centers. Novartis has announced a project using their institute in, in Singapore. So we're starting to see some action, but I wouldn't say it's a wholesale you know, conversion of the industry onto this. a risk when you when you for example make a vaccine that that vaccine will you know select even more virulent organisms um, but one hasn't seen that in history I think that part of the strategy at least with the flu vaccine is to use multiple um, uh, uh, sort of genes so that any flu vaccine that you take has multiple what are called epitopes or antigens represented so that you try to kind of cover the field but it's theoretically possible that you know you could do the magic thing and flip the organism into very virulent by a selection of a particular of a particular type um, but I, I don't think that's very likely but it's not theoretically impossible okay I think I've been time has been called <laughs> <laughs>